Thank you, Myron. Just a, a gracious guy, and we look forward to working with you for many years into the future. So what if you had an original idea or an original insight that demolished the anthropogenic global warming hypothesis, just demolished it, just took it apart, and it had nothing to do with physical science or economics or even engineering. So it wasn't some argument about how long carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere. It wasn't about interest rates. Uh, it was a different kind of insight, and it was so powerful that it just disproved the whole AGW hypothesis. What would happen? Well, you would be ignored by all the economists <laughs> and by all the scientists and by all the engineers because they wouldn't understand what you're talking about. Uh, most of the scientists have invested their whole career in developing these deep insights and complex theories about how the climate works, and they want to find the answer in physics or biology or geology. And most of the economists have devoted their whole career into measuring prices and interest rates, and they want to find a solution there. Well, so along comes Scott Armstrong, the next award winner, Scott is the world's leading authority on scientific predictions. There's a literature on this. How do you make a reliable prediction? And hundreds of scholars have written about this. Studies have been done comparing predictions. Which ones are reliable, which ones aren't? What are the rules that you should follow in order to make a reliable prediction? There's an actual science of prediction. So he founded this discipline. He wrote the articles, the founding articles. He wrote the book. He launched the journals. He created a society dedicated to it. And then one day he picks up a newspaper and sees an article about global warming and predictions about what the climate is going to look like 50 years from now or 100 years from now or 200 years from now. And he says, wait a minute, that, that doesn't make sense. I wonder if that's a scientific prediction. How did they arrive at that prediction? Well, it turns out it was a bunch of smart guys sitting around a table saying, well, what do you think, Bill? Well, I'm pretty confident that it's going to be four degrees in 50 years. And, well, how confident are you? 97%? Yeah, I'm 97% confident. And this is how the IPCC operates. You all know that. We're all laughing because it literally is how the IPCC operates. And they put numbers on it as if it's a confidence interval from statistics, but it's not. They literally sit around a table and talk about how sure they are and fabricate a number and pretend that they're confident. And they don't call them predictions. They call them forecasts or scenarios. Did they call them storylines or fables or parables? Um, and yet the media, not being you know, the brightest lights in the chandelier, <laughs> report this as if it were scientific predictions. They, they think the IPC is predicting this stuff. Um, so Scott Armstrong is an amazing guy. Uh, he has a great career. Um, he could have hung up his hat at any time and been very proud of having founded a discipline, written important books, really a pioneering expert on this discipline. But he decided to go into the climate change debate. And he showed beyond doubt that these forecasts are not scientific, that they're just made up, that they're not reliable. And if we can't forecast future climate, why are we talking about taxing energy or cap and trade or regulations or subsidies at all? I think it's a killer argument, a killer app, I guess is how people talk about it. This is the killer argument. You don't need to know a thing about carbon dioxide to know that this is all fake because they aren't making scientific predictions. So Scott Armstrong uh, has faced opposition for this. He has faced uh, uh, a refusal to be taken seriously. Uh, people don't listen to him because he's not an economist or working in the traditional economist field. You're a professor at University of Pennsylvania. So he's been very patient. He's been very effective. And I think he's a huge asset to this movement for many years. So we are giving Scott Armstrong the Lifetime Achievement Award for his tremendous work, for his insight and his courage in bringing this forward. So please welcome Scott Armstrong. Thanks for that lovely introduction and for the award. The award really means quite a bit for me because it's very rare that I'm in a situation or a conference
that I look around and I say, wow, there's a lot of people like me that had the same ideas about what science is. So it's a, a great uh, honor that I take it, that you give me this award. It took five people that were responsible for it. Uh, the first was, um, I'll do it in chronological order. First was uh, Kay Anderson Armstrong. Uh, she's a uh, health, health researcher, public health researcher. And she's also my wife and my best friend. And, and this is really interesting, my best editor. Uh, we've been together 53 years, married 53 years. And, uh, and she has read every one of my books and articles. And she's, like I say, my best editor because I'll have comments from like 40 people. I say to Kay at the end, she'll, uh, she'll tear it apart after that. You know, she'll still find things. It, sometimes I ask her and she says, well, I'm too tired to do it tonight. You know, if I do it, I won't find many things to change and you'll be upset with me. So. <laughs> Let me short intermissions because I'm midway through a cataract operation here. I'm one good eye and one bad eye here. Um, in addition to all this help on uh, editing, uh, she provides a lot of support. When you're, I think being a climate skeptic is the highest call. But you get a lot of, uh, a lot of things happen to you. A lot of bad things happen, much worse to other people, but some to me. And uh, Kay is always there for me. The uh, second person I want to recognize, without whom this would not have happened, is Julian Simon. In, uh, in the late 1960s, early 70s, I started reading this guy, Julian Simon, and I, he's about five years older than me, and I thought, wow, th I really like the way this guy approaches science. So it came along in 1981, I was invited out to the University of Illinois to interview for a chair in marketing, and Julian had been in the marketing department, so I was interested in the department because Julian's going to be there. And uh, we hit it off. It was just Im immediate. He says, first thing we're going to do is going to take a walk. So we took a walk outside. I don't know where we're going. It turned out past the plots. University of Illinois was an agricultural college, and they had plots, experimental plots. And he said, uh, this is what science is all about. It's all about experimentation. And at the time, I'd been doing a lot of uh, work with non-experimental data. And he got me to completely change my view. He also gave me advice along the way, like, uh, don't bother trying for grants. You're not going to get any grants. <laughs> uh, he's, he's been like five years ahead of me, at least, on these things. And I'm proud to report that I never have received a, a grant from anybody. So. <laughs> uh, He was into the global warming thing right away. And I thought he was a pretty good forecaster, but, but he said, you know, this one's not going to last long. So that's one of the bad forecasts he made. But you know. <laughs> uh, we hit it off right away. We, we communicate a lot. By that time, it was uh, by uh, telephone and by mail, actual mail. He'd send along letters with uh, dried, pressed tree leaves. I just love that. So. Uh, he uh, wrote a book called Against the Grain. And uh, it's about the trials that a skeptic goes through. So I think a lot of you would enjoy it. I, I got a lot of uh, great feelings. If, and I, I hadn't realized a lot of things about Julian. Though. What he was going through, it was a very, he went through a very tough time. He self-medicated for depression, and then he figured out how to solve his problem. And uh, so it's a very nice book to read. Kesson Green. Keston, um, these are all chronological, as I said. He, Keston uh, dropped out of college and decided uh, he's really an entrepreneur. So he started a lot of companies, and some of them did well, some of them didn't, didn't do so well. But then he decided, no, this wasn't really the right career. He wanted to be a scientist. So I was down giving a uh, lecture at the 25th anniversary of Massey Business School, and, or Massey University, and uh, uh, Keston managed to get together with me and told me that he figured he's really a scientist. He's doing the wrong thing now as an entrepreneur. So 
he wanted to work with me. And he goes, so he got in the PhD program and asked me to be his unofficial advisor. Um, pretty much from that day on, uh, when we got that thesis out of the way, he's uh, my number one guy. We work together every day. Uh, he's my second best friend. Kay's my best friend. He's my best, second best friend. So it's, it's a great experience. And uh, he does so many things. He does almost everything I can do and so much more. So he's, I feel that after I disappear here, there'll be somebody around. Uh, a few years ago, I uh, contacted Willie Soon because I heard he was the man. Now, then I talked to Willie about that. He said, no, you didn't contact me. Is that the way he says, no, you didn't contact me. I, you contacted me, <laughs> right? In any event, it's a, uh, boy, what an, a great experience it is to know Willie. Um, in uh, July 2015, I got a call from the New York Times, and the New York Times, a guy by the name of Justin Gillis, and I didn't know who he was, uh, and he said he's doing this piece on <laughs> Willie Soon, and, and he sounded like a nice guy, so could you tell me about Willie Soon? I said, wow, this guy, he's, he's, he's the man when it comes to uh, si climate science, and he's a great scientist, and he's honest and ethical. None of that appeared in that uh, interview. <laughs> Uh, so without Willie, I would not be here. Uh, it's uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Joe Best. I like uh, Richard Feynman's uh, description here about people solving problems. And I think Heartland exhibits it. Uh, Feynman said, I'd rather have questions that cannot be answered than answers that cannot be questioned. And I think that embodifies <laughs> Heartland. In, in my view, uh, Heartland's the most important organization in the world when it comes to exposing the climate change hoax. What is a scientist? Uh, actually, you kind of know it. Most of you knew it when you were kids. There wasn't any doubt about it. You didn't have to ask any questions. And I think there's a lot of people in the room, that's the way I feel. I think there's a lot of people in the room that feel that way. Uh, you, uh, you're addicted. You do science, you can't stop. So why do you do science on climate change where you get all these penalties? You don't, get money, you get money taken away from you when you do that. Why do you do that? Well, you do that because you know how. You know how to do that. You know how, you know, you do that because you must do it. You don't have any choice. I was reading this uh, uh, biography of Stanley Milgram, one of my heroes, and he met the woman of his future at a party one night, and they talked, and he's driving home, and he suddenly says to her, he says, you know, uh, I'm not a very exciting guy. I, I go upstairs every night and work on my research, and uh, I wouldn't be a good husband. <laughs> that was his like, first serious conversation with her. <laughs> that turned out to be his wife. <laughs> so we do science because that's what we do. We do it because we have no choice. We do it because it's our duty. Last summer, my, I had trouble getting through this one emotionally, but last summer I went to the 9-11 uh, museum and I cry easily when I got to the part about the firemen. Uh, you know, that's their duty. They go in there and that's what you guys do. So here's to Joe Bass and Hartman. <laughs>